Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing great today, Tim. Uh, we have a wonderful guest on who is one of the more researched and articulate people that we have on the show, uh, but in a very researched and articulate way. I would like to know how you are. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm doing great. I am excited to share this episode, this conversation that we had with Gray Hughes of Gray Hughes Investigates. And you can check out everything that he's doing at grayhughesinvestigates.com. And that's also his channel's name on YouTube. He's up to almost 100,000 subscribers. And you can find that at Gray Hughes Investigates. And Lance, he's been talking a lot about the Idaho Four. Those are the four victims who were murdered in Moscow, Idaho, who were students at the University of Idaho. And the victims' names are Madison Mogul, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernoodle, and Ethan Chapin. And this is a really, really, really tragic story of four individuals who are in their early 20s, just living the life of an early 20s adolescent. And the murders are so brutal that they're reminiscent of those serial killers of the 70s and 80s. But what I love about Gray's research on this and his investigation is that he puts together all of this information. He compiles it all and he's creating things like 3D animation, walkthroughs of the location of this crime so that you can get a sense of how the killer moved through the house. And that's not just to be salacious because you can go down a really salacious path with this and just try to do it for clicks. He's really interested to get people's feedback on how they think the perpetrator committed the crimes because that could tell you who it is based on who the first victim was. So does it make sense that the person would walk in here, go up the stairs, ignore one door, go to another door just to get to a specific person? So then you can look at that person and say, who is in that person's life? So he just tries to do it in a way where it's engaging, but also very educational and productive. And I love that. He does. And he also does 3D animations. So you may want to watch this one along with us on YouTube. And Gray's show is primarily a YouTube show. So a lot of times he's referencing the video that he made. He made an incredible 3D animation that you should check out. There are links in the show notes to that. And of course, these murders happened in November of 2022. And the police are looking for a white Hyundai Elantra from between 2011 and 2013 that was near the student's house in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022. So if you have any information on that, please submit that information to the Moscow police. And again, be sure to check out everything that Gray is working on by going to Gray Hughes Investigates on YouTube or GrayHughesInvestigates.com, and that's G-R-A-Y for Gray. And Tim, where can people go to access our subscription service as long as they're going places? Well, if you're going places, yeah, you can do it at crawlspace.supportingcast.fm or you can now subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It's just $4.99 a month. You get every episode of Crawl Space ad-free and you also get our weekly bonus show called The Subscription Show where we share a bit about life behind the scenes here and we also speak about the cases that we cover. We speak more candidly about the cases that we cover on The Subscription Show, Lance. We do. We sure do. And sometimes we have our partner, Jennifer Amel in. She does a lot of the research and she will communicate a lot of times with the family members to get them on the show. So it adds a really nice dynamic in that way. And speaking of Jennifer Amel, she's still very confused as to where to find us on social media. Can you just do a personal call to action for her? Where can she find us? Sure. Jen, you can find us on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and TikTok at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. And thank you very much for listening, Jen and everyone. We appreciate it. And hang around after these words from our sponsors for our great interview with Gray Hughes. Welcome back to the podcast, Gray Hughes of Gray Hughes Investigates. How are you today? Not too bad. i am uh, been really busy lately, so I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you guys about the the uh, Idaho murders case, the Idaho 4. 
I think that you might be amongst the top maybe 10 to 12 people that's the busiest in your industry. <laughs> you're you're you are always on and I am really looking forward to talking to you about this uh tragic uh this this tragic case, this tragic murder spree. Um I don't know if by definition that's a murder spree, but anyway, before we get into it, I just wanted to let you know that I'm paying you homage with my brick <laughs> oh, cool. background. Oh, nice. On, on Zoom yeah. here. Um, but I, I don't have this the same shade of brick red. I think you need to adjust it. I can't continue without it being <laughs> absolutely perfect. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, as long as I have your, per- no, as just, long yeah, as I have your permission. <laughs> but thank you for joining us. Oh, it's uh, a real well. pleasure. Yeah, it, it is a real pleasure. And we had you on, I think maybe last year or earlier this year to discuss La- Lori Vallow. And, oh, yeah. uh, and that was a case that you were covering, um, very closely at the time of, uh, her arrest and, um, you know, a, a lot going on in that case, but you have been working very hard on the Delphi case. I can see by your videos and you've also been diving very deep into the Idaho four murders, the, uh, the college students. And that is such a tragic case and you are yeah. keeping up with it. So, um, yeah, I would just love to hear a little bit about your experience just um, keeping up with the case, first off. Uh, well, I mean, I think I started covering it right at, near the beginning when it was just kind of like a, a whisper of the story that was out there. It was really, I mean, as, as it's gone on, it's just one of the creepiest, uh, I've never, and this is a kind of almost a one-of-a-kind recent case. I mean, I know everybody brings up Bundy, uh, he would do that. Uh, but I mean, four people murdered in one home, four college students, all really, you know, attractive people going places. I mean, they all were doing re- well in school and moving onward in life. And then somebody comes in there and just takes them all out in, in a one hour period of time. It's uh, really creepy. Uh, I don't really know. It's, it's hard to even explain it. And there isn't a lot, a ton and ton of information out there on the case, but there's a, but information has been given out by the father of Kaylee Gonsalves. So we have some extra information. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but. Yeah, no, it, it does. Yeah. And, and I agree. There's, there's so little information and you've been really creating um, information with your models and your live streams uh, which is, I feel like, really helping because when I first looked at this case, I thought I better stay away from it because I don't understand how we'd be able to help um, this case. The The police seem like they don't even know, you know, we, they're struggling to find leads. Um, and so I didn't really want to get too involved, but then I started watching your videos and I saw that there was stuff that we could do to... Um, help share with the public um, some some clues and uh, you know like this vehicle and uh, surveillance footage and or, or or the need for surveillance footage and things like that. So I do appreciate uh, all your hard work on this case. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's been really um, you know it was challenging and at first uh, you know just to find really accurate, clear information. But um, I think there was layouts made of put out there by the homeowner that the four college students were living in. And so I created a 3D model and it really allows people to visualize where somebody maybe had entered the home, probably the sliding glass door on the second floor. That's where Kaylee's father says that he was told that law enforcement believes they came in. And then you sort of wonder, uh, you know, if we could figure out who the target was, then that might actually help people to start narrowing uh, in in the public's minds who they might want to be looking at. You know, I know it, it's kind of crazy with social media. And if you even said hello to her on a video somewhere, you're now a serial killer. You know, it's uh... <laughs> right. Yeah. I'd like to back it up just a little bit 
Um, with what you do with your YouTube channel, what do you do when something like this happens? I know you said that this is a once in a generational or once in a you know, current lifetime occurrence. Uh, and most people only are able to reference Ted Bundy. But, you know, you had Delphi and mm -hmm. there have been other ones. When you have yeah. a piece of news that breaks like that, what's your first instinct? Well, my first instinct is to make sure that it's at least if, if other news outlets are reporting it then I feel like it's safe to talk about. Um, if it's just sort of, somebody said, it usually comes from Reddit or Facebook somewhere, and yeah, then at that point I have almost zero faith in it. But uh, my, you know, my instinct is to look at it and try to put it out in a way that's easily understandable by people. And by doing that, you're informing people who are not familiar with this particular crime. I don't mean just this one specifically, but right. the crime that you're talking about. So you're informing the public. And is that a, a, a way to have a, a public service announcement to educate them on something that they could be doing differently or maybe keep a lookout for something? Yeah, well, when I, well, the other day I put out a video where I went through all of the information that law enforcement has put out, read right through it, and then had my own commentary about each of the elements. And then you put out the phone numbers and, you know, they're looking for that, the white um, Hyundai Elantra. I always want to say Hyundai. I don't know why I can't pronounce that. But I do too. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the, what the deal is there. but It's Hon the why. Yeah. Why, why is it spelled like that? Come on, you guys. <laughs> It should be H O N D A Y or something. But anyways, the uh, uh, you know you put all of that in the articles, and then hopefully, and the phone numbers and the email, and hopefully somebody who's seeing it sees something or remembers something and can come forward. And I and also think it's valuable to. There's so much sensationalism on, in true crime on social media now that. I try to have a channel that's, we do speculate, but it's really reasonable stuff based on the information that's in news articles or law enforcement has put out. Yeah, so. it's it's really helpful because there's one form of news that's out there where you'll get the two minute, three minute clip about what what's happened. And if you want to get further into it, you have your channel. So it is really helpful for anybody, especially anyone in the area of a crime that you're talking about. Keep an eye out for mm -hmm. and call this number in case you see this person. I think that's incredibly helpful. Yeah, it's uh, I think it's I think it's something that more creators should do. I, I mean, I do seven days a week shows. I mean, it's crazy. Seven, seven days, three to four hours every single night. And lately I've been doing call-in shows and there's been a lot of interesting calls. Of course, trolls take the opportunity to call in during that time too. For some reason, they like to take that time during such a horrific tragedy to berate and make fun of people. I mean, it's just absolutely wild, but that comes with the territory. I mean, I'm sure you guys are aware of people that do that, right? Although maybe you guys are immune to it. You guys are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we never don't, received we don't never it. received one piece of criticism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, I was facetious. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, have you gotten comments um, in your coverage of the Idaho for uh, victims? Have you gotten comments from people who knew them and or family members? Um, I don't think that there's I haven't read through every single comment on each video, but I haven't heard from uh, any calls or anything like that from family members. I think they've been told to kind of remain quiet about it, except for uh, Kaylee's father and their whole family basically have been on a lot of different news channels. I've reached out to them, but I, I don't think that they're really hanging out a lot on social media. It's more the main media outlets. Mm hmm. Gosh, there must be such a, a shock uh, with these murders that's happened in this town and this campus, the family members. I mean, I can't even imagine the paranoia. Yeah. It, it, well, the thing, one of the things I think Steve Consalves, the father of Kaylee, came forward and called. He referred to the police as cowards, and I, and I was like, what, what does that mean? And then it was through conversations on my show, people kind of explained it. And I was like, okay. So what he's saying is they're not putting out enough 
information on who they believe the killer might be based on a profile, a male, uh, you know, whatever the profile is, and they're not getting that out uh, to protect the university and make sure that students come back. And, um, you know, it's a big financial hit. Like, let's say 10,000 students didn't come back. I mean, my God, that's millions of dollars, you know, tens of millions that they're not getting. So I could see if that is the real reason they're not putting that out making people scared to come back, then that would be considered pretty, you know, I don't know if it coward, cowardly is the right word, but something. Right. Yeah. yeah I hate that narrative. Um, when, when law enforcement are potentially protecting institutions locally for, you know, tourist dollars, or in this case, uh, education and tuition and things like that. I'm sure that keeps, keeps the entire small town, small area, uh, afloat. Um, but it just seems like a crazy case. I, I couldn't believe it. It hadn't been solved, uh, like pretty much immediately. Mm -hmm. I guess, what do you know about, about the case? What, what do you know about this vehicle, this white Hyundai Elantra? Well, uh, there was, I think it was an F, an ex FBI agent or somebody said that they know that the vehicle was there. Now, I don't know if you guys would, would you know, would want to go through the timeline. I could probably just zip it out really quick. Um, the, I think it was Kaylee and Madison were at the corner club from 10 to 1.30 a.m. And corner club is just north of where that grub truck video is that people saw. So they were in, in, in town at the corner club. Then they walked a couple blocks to, they left there at 1.30 and then went to the grub truck around 1.40. There's a guy with a hoodie kind of standing around. They, apparently he, he was there to make sure because they were Madison. Madison was absolutely really looked like she'd had a lot, lot to drink. She couldn't stand very well. And they were both ordering food, Madison and Kaylee. And then they got into another vehicle and got a ride home. And that guy that was standing there walks probably back to get into a vehicle because there's a parking lot back towards the direction he was going. So then they got a ride home and they got home at 156 from the person that they had got into the car with by the grub truck. They got home at 156. And then Zena and Ethan were at a Sigma Chi party from nine until apparently 145. All they ever say is we believe Ethan and Zena were home around 145. Now, how they know that is that because the uh, one of the roommates house or room is directly below Zena and Ethan's room. Okay. Um, so did they hear something around that time? Cause the other two roommates that survived, they lived on the low, the bottom floor. And I mean, I'd show you it on the map, but if you're doing, you know, if this is an audio thing, it's hard to explain, but when you go to the house, there is, or the three model I made, not the map, but anyways, there's a, a lower level that's kind of narrow, has two roommates that live down there. As soon as you open the main door, there's steps that go straight up to the second floor, which is also narrow right above that. But then there's a, like, that's called 2A and right, and that's right above that. And that means over to the right is where Zena, uh, Zena's room was, which is directly above one of the roommates. Then there's this little opening from that level that goes uh, onto 2B, where there's a little opening that drops down a foot or eight inches or so. <laughs> and then in that one, that's where you got a, a U-shaped stairs that go up to the third floor. You also have a room to the left just before you go up the stairs. That is a, that's a room that nobody is using currently. And then to the right is the kitchen. So then you go up the stairs. And when you get to the top of the stairs, if you take a left, that goes to Kaylee's room, which is right above the kitchen. But apparently they weren't in that room. They were in Madison's room that when you go to the top of the stairs, you take a right and it's just down there. So that's about as good an explanation I can do for audio listeners. Well, well done. Yeah. <laughs> in terms uh, of the layout there. <laughs> <laughs> well, your 3D models are, are great. Um, I, I have to ask, how do, how do you make them? Well, I actually went to, I learned to do 3D modeling and animation on my own. And then I went to the Art Institute for two years in Portland and learned to use 3D Studio Max. And so every year I keep purchasing the $1,500 a year license on it just to be able to make stuff like this. 
uh, it's it takes a long time. You have to get the layout and you build up the walls and the stairs and it gets really complicated. Um, but uh, once it's done, it's really useful for showing people how things might have went down just so people have a better understanding. I mean, even if just something like that make make more people interested and the more people that are interested, the more people that know about the case and the more people that know about the case, the more uh, higher chance that somebody will come forward that has information. And you had mentioned earlier about if we had known who the primary target was of these attacks, then maybe that would lead to some sort of clue or lead to somebody. And I feel like your 3D model, if you were able to figure out where the person entered and even like the path that the person took, who the first person was uh -huh. that was that was killed could be a, a good indicator. So I don't know if that was kind of in your reasoning when you created this 3D model. Yeah, I made uh, three different versions. Uh, they yeah. all include the sliding glass door. So you go through the sliding glass door of the kitchen. Well, anyways, here's the sliding glass door outside. And let me let me just show you, before we even get to that, I can show you, like, here is the building now. It's really starting to, uh, you know, it looks almost exactly like you see it on the news, right? So there's the uh, sliding glass door. I just switched over to that camera that you saw sitting there. And you go through the sliding glass door, and as it goes forward there, I just have the person look both ways, and then it goes upstairs. This is what people, when I did a vote of like 2,000 people voted, they all think, and this is just a character left over, so don't worry about that. <laughs> so it goes up the stairs. This is Kaylee's room right there. Didn't go into that room, but it was this one right here, Madison's room, where apparently uh, they were both killed in this room, Madison and Kaylee. And the father has said that his daughter's wounds were different. So it sounds like he's uh, claiming that his daughter seems to be the target uh, of the, the killer. And so a theory that people have is after going in here, killing, you know, had to kill uh, Madison because she was there with Kaylee. Then goes down the stairs here. Again, forget that person there. And then... This is that 2A that I was telling you about right here. See those stairs right down those stairs are the two roommates. Uh, but right. Uh, let's see. So here we go. We're, there's the stairs and then take a left. And this is Zena and uh, where Ethan were staying. And likely this is just how the bed was based on how things are laid out. And then what's crazy. And then the killer in this case could have gone out this way because somebody said the door was open at 830 in the morning. But uh, the people, the way that people voted for the most was at this point, they turned right and went back out the kitchen door. And I know that probably didn't work at all for your audio no, listeners. That's, but... <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's, yeah. it, it's really interesting to see this mm -hmm. and be inside in a virtual sense mm -hmm. because, first of all, the crime that was committed here seemed like there could have been more opportunity to cause just as much damage by staying on the first level and mm -hmm. and and leaving right yeah but uh, the back the the sliding glass door is in an, in a isolated area kind of hidden away from the view of a lot of people there's actually a road up above in the back like if i went to street view here mm -hmm. uh let's see where is it right back here see where that car's parked right there yeah mm -hmm. you can actually see into the house during the fall months with no leaves, just from being parked right there. And then you would go down this little hill into, and right here is the the deck underneath the sliding glass door to the kitchen. So it's right there. This this is the entrance to the sliding glass door. So let's say you were there and you walked down and you go into the, um, the sliding glass door, you might want to exit the same way too. So you would go upstairs and let's say you kill Madison and uh, Kaylee up there. And then when you come down, there was enough noise that it woke up maybe Ethan, right? And then he comes out. What's going on? And he gets killed. And then apparently Zayna has defensive wounds on her hands. But the coroner says that it appears that they were all sleeping when the attacks occurred. So I don't mm -hmm. know how to take. I mean, that theory makes sense, but then it doesn't make sense based on what the coroner said. 
I, I mean, it would suggest that the person was targeting those four people. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I actually think that the killer went in. My opinion is, is that they were all targeted. However, it could be a scenario where, let's say the, there was a person that was attracted to one of them and really thought they should be his, you know, those psychos. That, she should be mine and blames the other roommates for not being the one that she chose or something. Like, mm-hmm. he's really angry at them and blames them. So they don't get the brunt of it. They're just killed. And then the his the person of his desires got the brunt of the attack. Right. That's just a theory, you know, of course. But I just want to ask a quick question about this uh, Google Earth image that you have here. And you actually referenced the car. You said this car here could have, there could have been, uh-huh. you know, that car there. Um, is that like a parking lot? Why is that car on Google Earth in the first place? Is that a parking lot? Yeah, well, there's an apartment here, and it looks like you can get in here. But one one thing that is interesting, remember they mentioned the white um, Hyundai Elantra? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, here here's something that people should be aware of, is that there's no way out of here other than this road. Like, if you're parked right here, you can only go out this way. If you're parked here, yeah. you can only go out that way. You can see right th- there. There's no way that there's no yeah. driving like this. And then you can see a little wall there. So they're certain that the Elantra scene, uh, I actually think it was seen on this camera. Now, here's the thing. There's a camera right on the side of this building right here. And that would explain how they know that Kaylee and Madison got home at 156. I don't know if I said 256 earlier. If I did, I was an No, I think you said 156. So you're saying that this Hyundai Elantra or really um, whoever killed these four students and then left, if they left the neighborhood, they would have had to, in a car, in a vehicle, they would have mm-hmm. had to have driven past there? Yeah. And see, this is a light in this picture from 2021. But if you look at the ones taken just recently, it's a camera screwed into the light. Mm. I think it's a ring camera. So, yeah, I think that you have to go by there. I've looked all around. There's no way out. So that might be how they know for certain that it was an, a, a 2011 to 2013 Elantra and that it was leaving at three. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they said the time, actually, uh, what time it left, but they know it was there during the time of the murders. Now, this is something that I think is really important with what you're doing, considering that maybe there was somebody driving that same car in that area and it was that person, but they had nothing to do with the with the murders. And with this information out there, they can say, oh, I was there, you know, and maybe that could clear somebody and it could create a little bit more, I don't know, opportunity to investigate other leads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because no one's saying that this car is directly related. It just happened to be leaving a place. It could honestly be a car from the neighborhood. It could be somebody yeah. going to like a night shift or something or yeah, it could whatever. Be, but uh, you know, the thing is, I actually think they believe that that car is related to the murders. And the reason I think that is because they're so focused on it. You know, yeah. they keep wording it like, hey, you know, we just want to talk to the person. But remember they said that in the Delphi case when the, they put out the picture of the guy on the bridge. They said, yeah, we just want to talk to him. We, we believe he was in the air. He might have seen something. No, uh, that's not... So I don't know. They're they're way focused on this vehicle, and they're going to do all this work just to find a car that maybe saw something. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. And it's such a small area. You would think that a lot of these cars were identifiable in that neighborhood. It seems like really only a few residences uh, way back in that in that uh, area there. More than a few, but not too many. And it's interesting too because the area that they say they need surveillance camera footage from is right like this it's in this area however yesterday a gas station right here at this exxon gas station they put out a photograph that looks a hell of a lot like a an elantra i won't even say the first name but the elantra and it was a shot at 3 45 a.m and it's driving by and look how close the i mean it's literally a straight shot right down this road here um, looks like uh, Lauder Avenue and then boom you're right there it's only 1.13 miles away and it was at 3:45 a.m. so and there's right. two cameras on the side of this uh, there's a car wash so there's a camera right here and a camera right there 
the image of the vehicle it's really blurry and crappy but it looks like it's going this way so it's either it looks like it's taken on this side so it's going that way but see then it's hard to you know it, there's a lot of white cars out there right i mean <laughs> a lot of white elantras and yeah but at 345 how many people are awake driving around at 345 a.m and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. They also did say that they had, you know, it's kind of standard, but they bagged the hands of each of the mm-hmm. victims right when they got there and made sure, you know, that if there's any DNA under the fingers or even on the hands, because if you touch the person, you could get their sweat or just DNA yeah. on your fingers. So, Yeah, we, now when this case first um, happened, it was quite shocking that you heard that these victims were asleep. Um, and I know there's, as we talked about some debate over exactly what that means. It seems yeah. like they were asleep when they were attacked at least right, or when, yeah. when it, it, the attack began. Um, and then there were some defensive wounds that, uh, that occurred, but just that in general sounds so crazy to me that this, that this unknown person would likely enter their house and do this um, pretty quickly. Um, but this is also like a college neighborhood, college kids. I, I understand they had like a, a keypad for their door. Yeah, apparently each, I didn't realize this on my show. I was like, come on, keypads for each door. They have a keypad for outside and then each one has a keypad on their door. So I was a little bit humbled by that. I was like, really? <laughs> but anyways, the way it works apparently is that you have to, to lock it, you have to type in the keypad from outside. Let's say you're leaving. You have to type in the number. And then when you come back, you have to type it in to get into your room. But when you're inside the room, you have to turn just a little lock button, you know, like a, like just like a regular deadbolt type thing. You turn it, and then that sets the lock. So either the person knew the combinations or they, the doors, people didn't lock their doors. Maybe they felt comfortable in their home. You know, what do you, what do you think? I think it'd be amazing if someone knew the combinations, because what do you have to do to find out the combination of somebody's private door lock on their, on their room? You know, you have to be in their presence for a period of time where either you see it and you memorize it or they, they're comfortable enough to tell you. So I have to say, just thinking about this, they probably didn't lock it from the inside, but both sets of victims didn't lock their doors like that seems odd to me too yeah that that is strange but here's something that somebody came up with that i thought sounds really plausible you have all these fr- uh, roommates that are friends right maybe you would just all have the same combination you know like hey you know if you need to get into my room here's what it is but we don't want anybody from the outside so then all of a sudden there's more people that have the number you know maybe it's just some you know zero one seven six for all four of them and it made it easy for each one to go get something if, in one of the other rooms uh, instead of right. memorizing. But there are, you know, there's also two other roommates downstairs that uh, they had locked their doors because apparently early on it had come out that they heard noises and locked their doors. Really? So, that night? Yeah, that night, yeah. And so here's the thing. I, this is what I believe. So you can take what you want with it, but it says that they got home between – they got home at one o'clock in the morning, and then this is the narrative by the police. They got home at one and woke up late afternoon. That seems to me like they're just leaving out a lot of stuff there. And I, I and here's the, you know, if you look at the house structure and you see that one roommate is right below Zena's room, it even takes up the same footprint on the floor below, like literally every square inch of it. Um, then if there was a battle in that room, is that what? prompted them to wake up and lock the door and if so there it might have sounded maybe like a party but a little bit more because you know you're locking the door and i think it's possible that they even saw or heard some things and just huddled up in their room they weren't sure what to do with the information and in the morning texted some friends after maybe creeping up the stairs looking around maybe seeing some legs on the floor or something and they probably relayed a bunch of stuff to the friends and on that 911 call, they say those things, and that's why we're not going to get to be able to hear that. 
That's just I, a theory. Yeah. <laughs> I never considered that until you just said that, that they might have been awake for a while just trying to figure out what was going on. It probably took hours before they felt safe enough to leave the room. And they probably told the police all of that. And it's just easier for the police to communicate to the media. They're not suspects. They slept through the attack. Also Instead of yeah. getting into like the gory details yeah. of what actually happened, that's not going to do them any good. It also protects them a bit, too. They, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I could see I see that happening a lot more than them sleeping through it. If the door was locked and early on it was stated that they heard something and locked the door. Yeah. One thing that's interesting, too, is they're they're really trying to figure out the timeline of Ethan and Zena from nine to one forty five, which is pretty interesting. If if Kaylee is the target that they're aware of, they seem really focused in on trying to really fill out the timeline of Zena and Ethan, and shouldn't that be simple since they were at the Sigma Chi house with hundreds of people? I mean, wouldn't that just be a real simple thing to figure out? So one of the, one theory that I sort of threw out there as a possibility is, did they come home and did they, I mean, let's just say, for the sake of argument, that white Elantra was already there. They come in and there's this person hanging out in the house and that person attacks them in their room earlier. And we don't even know if, because this could have been much earlier. They could have been killed since they got home apparently at 145. Maybe it was 2 o'clock and we don't have any indication that Kaylee and Madison even saw Zena and Ethan when they got home. We have no idea at all. So it could have been this guy just hanging out in the, I mean, that's creepy as hell to think about, but he could have been in the house waiting and when they got home went up there and killed them too and just never made it down to the first floor maybe just could have the perpetrator could have been in the house for a long time yeah i mean i mean i think initially you think that he followed them or i can't say he but initially you think the person followed them and snuck in after but is there any indication that he hadn't been there for hours no that's the thing and apparently that house is a party house if people come and go they're people just chilling out in the it's a really convoluted home, to be honest with you. It seems like 15 different architects got involved at different times and added on something. But, I mean, there's a living room area and a kitchen. It's basically where I think just random people might hang out in. Not the rooms, because there, there's nothing to do up there other than be in the rooms. So, you know, maybe there was just some random guy hanging out in the living room when they came home, but then you might, then the person must have left though at one point, because why would anybody go to sleep with some random weirdo sitting in the living room? Yeah. Can you think of that? <laughs> what do you think? I yeah. mean, no, I, but <laughs> it, it almost seems like it has to be someone who knows them. Right. Um, yeah. you know, possibly entering with a key, uh, you know, the keypad, uh, combination, um, and showing some familiarity and then um but i i'm just so confused with the behavior like uh if this was you know and hypothetically someone who saw them earlier in the night um you know this is someone who didn't express rage at that point no one observed any bizarre behavior then and then theoretically in the month since those murders, there's been no uh, behavior, like huge behavior, red flags that someone's turning in a tip about. Um, there's no defensive wounds on people who knew them, who were angry or who had a crush on one of them. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I just, yeah. I'm so shocked that there's none of that that's come out. Yeah. It starts making you think that it's a little something different than what would it appear to be at the beginning. It seemed like it might've been, I mean, it still could be somebody really close to them. We yeah. just, you know, we're not being told enough information to be able to decide on that. Uh, one of the, one of the, you know, go ahead. Like, but if this was a, a student who knew them and is, is like continues going to school afterwards, can you even yeah. picture that happening? Yeah, no, it's crazy. Did he go off for about three weeks somewhere, come back to make sure all the injuries were healed up? You know. But that would be a huge red flag if they did, if they just didn't right. go to classes for a few weeks. Yeah. Uh-huh. It could have been a Thanksgiving break excuse. Yeah. But I mean, you're like, I think scratches and cuts don't take heal that quick unless he said, well, we extended our Thanksgiving <laughs> break. You know, I know what you're saying. Yeah. 
Yeah. Wasn't there some report about, I think it was Kaylee who had a stalker? Yeah. And they found a couple of guys that followed her out of a, a restaurant. And it seemed like they cleared the stalker idea. But now they've put it back in there because I think friends were saying, no, that's not what we, that she was talking about. So they, they still have that out there, that, but they've never been able to verify or find anything related to a stalker on their, on their own in investigation other than that other incident that they cleared those people. Um, one thing that I think is really, I've, you know, it was interesting was that at 2.26 in the morning, Kaylee starts calling her ex-boyfriend and calls him six times up until 2.44, and then because they thought maybe the ex-boyfriend was screening the calls, Madison called three times from 2.44 to 2.52. And then Kaylee tried one more time at 2.52, and then that was those are the last calls. So that means they were still absolutely awake at 2.52. Some people suggest that maybe the killer did that, but, man, that's so complex for – a killer to sit there that long sending these text messages and then switch phones and it was them okay they were awake and they were they, they weren't texting they were phone calls but they were in their room probably just laying down trying to get a hold of him for whatever reason but i wonder why you would think that he was screening the call like what were they arguing or it could just be they wanted to get a hold of him but i'm not sure why he'd be screening the phone call Maybe he was asleep. I mean, it's that's what he said. Pretty late. That's what he said. Yeah. yeah. He said he was asleep. And then another person said, uh, what was it? Well, I also heard that he also didn't answer to sort of play because it's hard to get sort of, you know, like I'm not always going to be here mm. for your, cause a, a friend, a, apparently a friend said that. So if that's true, then man, he probably feels really bad. I mean, think about that. Like they're trying to get a hold of you and maybe you would have came over could have saved his life too, though. We don't really know. But. Yeah, possibly. That's true as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, um, no, nothing known on why they were calling him. No, there's no information on that. I'm sure law enforcement might know, but uh, that's definitely not something they're going to tell us. But they they did clear the ex boyfriend. They said at this time we don't think he's involved, or I think it's even more strongly worded than that. You you had said that they weren't texting. There was no text messages, or you or that's not well. Those known. are I think those were phone calls that weren't responded yeah. to. But I think there are text messages on the phone throughout that evening. I just don't know what those are. They don't share that stuff. Yeah, and and no one should feel bad about that. You know, a young man receiving phone calls at that time in the morning isn't expecting his ex-girlfriend to get brutally murdered no, you know no, it's not just a little while later he's probably looking at it and saying if it was really an emergency they would probably leave a message or they would text me to say like listen this is an emergency if it was really an emergency mm-hmm. and honestly not to make light of it he probably didn't want to talk to anybody at, at that time mm-hmm. i mean yeah that conversation obviously was going to be something where they were probably still a little intoxicated and he just didn't want to deal with that at that moment. So, yeah, I mean, of course, like in retrospect, it, it, knowing it, he would have picked up the phone. He would have gone over, but there's no way anyone would ever have that in anywhere in their head. No. And I don't know. I just don't think that, um, I mean, if, I, I don't think that they were feeling like they were in danger at that time. That, that's the weird part about it is I think that because they apparently went to sleep and were attacked. If they were like, oh, my God, let me call my boyfriend. There's somebody weirdo. Are they going to sleep at that point? I think no, they're calling 911. Yeah, yeah. You might you call 911 or other people out there to come over to make sure, you know. A lot of times college students don't call 911 just because it's like, oh, the cops, you know. I don't want to make it a big deal in case this guy is. And, and I think that might even be what happened with the two roommates in the morning. They got friends over first, and then they used one of their phones to call, one of the roommate's phones to call 911. The roommate themselves didn't call 911, which right. is, you know, people make a big deal out of that. But, I mean, you know, people are just different. People act differently. We're, we're not all the same. That's one of the things people say, well, if I would do this, therefore they should have done that. And if because they didn't do that, now they're nefarious. 
Right. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's a lot of weird no. things that happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're, and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. Now, what about this dog that was killed and apparently skinned? Uh, not that long before the murders and not that far. Yeah, it's that... pretty close to yeah. the, um, you know, the house there. But they said that they don't, they can't find any connection. But that wouldn't be too shocking. I mean, how would you connect that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, maybe the same type of knife, maybe. But I don't know when they say we can't find a connection between the dog and this killer. Well, I don't know. Just that it's kind of a sociopathic psycho move. Yeah. Somebody living right there. Maybe it's related. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's the behavior, right. And, and potentially the weapon, um, that we, you know, is on a, still unidentified, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a common marker for people who, who end up uh, becoming serial killers or, or killers. They, uh, hurt animals, uh, before doing so. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't know if they do it so soon before, um, but uh, but it definitely is is one of the indicators of of a future of violence, you know, that that you may have. So, yeah, I mean, m maybe there's no obvious connection, which that makes sense if they don't know who the killer is, they don't know who killed the dog, they can't say it's definitely related. But from you know uh, where we sit, or where I sit, Massachusetts, the behavior sounds pretty related to me. Yeah, it's pretty disturbing. Yeah. You, 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 my my first thought was that it was the killer, one practicing on a living thing and seeing if this weapon that they had would be capable of doing what this person wanted it to do. So I'm gonna skin the dog, you know, like really, can I do it? Can the weapon do it? And then I started like it's that started kind of crumbling in my head because I was thinking, why would this person do this so close? Yeah. Not in time, but in like proximity. Why wouldn't you drive a little bit further out where if it's ever found, it would be much less of a chance of any connection. And then it started to come back together in my head because then I was like, well, the person just didn't care. Yeah. Because it didn't it didn't matter. You know, they'll never they'll never connect this to me. They make it sound like it's not related, though. I mean, I would say the odds are it's not, but it wouldn't shock me if it was related because that's psycho yeah. kind of stuff. I show. I actually had where the location was where they found the dog itself. But the people living there, where that owned the dog, live right down the street. I mean, it was crazy. Somewhere right, like right around in this area here. Oh man! And check this thing out. Early on, almost immediately, there was a sex offender that lived right here and here. I mean, two different pins. I mean, that's pretty crazy. But apparently, they're not related. But man, they're just literally. 50 feet away inside these apartments right here. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's pretty common around, you know, uh, which is crazy, you know, just kind of mind blowing in itself. Um, yeah. The murder of a dog, though, I feel like less common. I, I, I can't get past it. I, I have to imagine that's related in my head. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. It wouldn't shock me a bit. It's just that they're, they're saying, I, I guess what all they're really saying is we can't tie them together, but that doesn't mean yeah. they're not. Now, have you guys heard about the, the, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but the wounds that Steve Gonzalez talked about, he talked about that they were you know, yeah. more like tears and like yeah. just really brutal stuff going on. Like maybe it wasn't even a sharp knife, it just, but it was a point on it. Right. I mean, what um, is that weapon, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk about that. Because yeah. the coroner said that there was blood all over the walls too. And I don't want to get too graphic with it, but I think there's something to be learned here. Yeah, it just feels like um, it's a lot more brutal than maybe we thought, but I guess uh, the coroner thinks that they died pretty quick, which I guess in some ways it's a good thing, but I mean, none of it, there's really hardly anything you could say is good, but you wouldn't want him to suffer too long. But uh, he said that his daughter, his, her wounds were different, and he kind of described like something in the liver and somewhere else, and you know. Um, yeah, I mean, there's blood all over the place. Uh, the coroner, well, the father said that there was a battle downstairs. So that would be with Zena and Ethan. And you know that Zena had the 
uh, defensive wounds on her hand. So, you know, if I if you were, if you were a killer strategically and you snuck in a, into a bedroom, you probably would kill the male first to get get some blows in, and then she might have woke up and tried to defend him and started fighting, and then she had defensive wounds and got killed too. And then maybe he tried to. I don't know. I mean, I, we don't know what where their bodies were specifically. We know that. Kaylee and Madison were found in the same bed together. Zane and Ethan is a little bit more um, sketchy of where they were specifically. Right. They woke up during the attack, it sounds like. Did you say Madison's father, Stephen, had this information? I think if I said that, I meant Kaylee. Okay. Or either way, so you said Kaylee's father, Stephen, had this information. Mm -hmm. Where did he get that information? Well, I think he was probably... Uh, the coroner, for one, told him, apparently, now the family's backtracking that he never said that. You know, but, you know, Fox News put out the article. They've had people there gain the trust of him. I actually think that it's more of a backtracking by the family because that wasn't supposed to be put out there than it being a false story. It's still out. The story's still there. It hasn't been taken down. Um, so I guess, you know. Take it with uh, a mild grain of salt, but it sounds like a a true story. Uh, yeah, it sounds like he got it from the the coroner. Mm-hmm. What do you th- imagine a helpful, um, l- like a helpful tip would look like in this case? Like if this case was was going to break at some point, what? How, how do you see that happening? That's a that's a good question. I think it's people like the gas station attendant over there. I mean, it's gonna be it's gonna be surveillance. I think there's got to be cameras all around. I was a little bit confused at why they just wanted cameras over here. If I was them, I would have said the entire city. It's not that big of of Moscow, Idaho. If you see anybody moving around between three and five a.m. on your cameras, send it to us. The entire city, because who who's really on? Uh, I mean, most people aren't still moving around in vehicles between three and five, even on a Saturday night. You know, bars are closed. People, almost everybody gets home around two to two thirty, three to five. There's very few cars still moving around. And I think I'd like to see every single vehicle and every camera that picked up anything anywhere during that time, even if somebody walking. I mean, that just seems like the most useful thing to come in is is video surveillance. You know, it's um, other than that. I mean, who's going to be awake to see somebody come out of the house and, or anything? It's crazy. I mean, even Uber or Lyft drivers don't really operate at that time because, like you said, the bars and clubs have already been closed and it's been a couple of hours since people have probably needed any rides. But, you know, I guess there could be a couple uh and I was wondering when I thought about that, did they end up taking an Uber or a Lyft? Because all I've seen is that it says like a private car service or. I've heard or, varying things somewhere that it was yeah. like a service from the sorority to get rides home for people. I've heard Uber. And, you know, one thing that's sort of interesting is they left it downtown. I think it was like 140 uh six or so and they get home at one uh 56 but it's a, the drive isn't doesn't take that long i don't know if that makes it any more interesting but the drive from there should only take maybe i don't know four minutes at the most it's not far so there's a little bit of missing time there but uh it's not enough where you know who knows maybe they stop at a 7-eleven or something <laughs> you know i don't know Yeah. Yeah. I mean, could have been some sort of traffic incident or something that held them up, but you really can't discount that though. I mean, even saying something like that could pop something in someone's memory and say, oh, that's right. I did see a car stop at a 7-Eleven or something, and then you can check cameras. Yeah. Well, apparently at this, um, I saw it on the news yesterday, they were filming this A&W in a camera as if that's one of the cameras. Now look how crazy that is. If that is a and w camera right here and then that other camera the exxon's right there so that'd be absolutely crazy if it picks up any white elantra at 345 moving by there's two cameras here if you look at this building the car wash here um so 
describing it. If you're looking at the Exxon car wash from the front, there's a front entrance and there's a camera on this side going in and that would show a vehicle going this direction. Then, um, let's see, on the other side of the building, on this side, if you go to this street view, so that could have been the one that picked up the car going this way at 345. So, you know, if, if that is a vehicle that was involved at 345, they seem to be in a hurry, they said. Uh, that would be on the way there, because uh, if you look at the map, and it's driving by this direction, then it would go down this this road and end up being take a little bit of time to get over to where the crime scene was so i don't know i mean it's just a so it looks like an elantra to 345 it might not have anything to do with anything <laughs> you know that's where we're at here it's really shocking you gotta admit that with a case so brutal that after a month they still don't have a suspect i mean that's at least they're not saying they have one that's pretty it's, wild. It is shocking. Yeah, it makes you it makes you wonder if it could be random, but I know we've kind of talked about how it sounds like it isn't or wouldn't be, but uh yeah, it's just shocking. It's shocking someone could theoretically walk in and walk out, someone who knew them mm -hmm. do that and then just fade back into wherever they were and not make anyone think that they did something unless they did and you know, haven't, uh, those people haven't turned in a tip or anything yet. I don't know. Do, do you guys think that they're, I mean, it seems like it'd almost be impossible not to have left DNA behind in this case. It's gotta be, gotta be some Very DNA tough, there. some way, you know, like, however it is, you know, a little bit of sweat somewhere or touch something or, you know, under the fingernails of one of the victims, something. And man, here's a, a thought that I had the other day. I think this should exist is rapid forensic genetic genealogy and it can be rapid you just quickly get the sequence right as soon as you get the sequence as soon as the sequence may uh created that takes like a day or two if you want to you know you oh we got to put it in the line no you don't man with something like that front of the line get the sequence and then you put it into bioinformatics which actually creates a a raw data kit very similar to what you download from ancestry dna and then you upload it right to gedmatch and then get like three of the best forensic gene genealogists all together and just start D -d 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 boom <laughs> i mean they would have a name like i bet you within three weeks of doing it, it unless, you know unless it, there's bad luck and there's nobody in his lineage that uploaded to one of the sites but anyways it seems like that's just the way to do it i would have that going on the same time frame well Great. This has been, uh, yeah, a, a great, uh, a great conversation here today. And we really appreciate you spending some time with us today and telling us a bit about, uh, the Idaho four murders and your work in them. And, uh, we really, uh, really appreciate all your work on this case. Well, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people making videos out there. I just have my own way of doing it and I try to make it where it's easily, understandable and try to put the pieces together that are known and like factual piece of information or if they're in a credible news story uh, those are the ones i tend to use not posts on reddit or facebook yeah and you do a really excellent job with all of that and the 3d renderings that you put to, out there to the public i think the service that you're providing speaks for itself i think that you stay away from the salacious you you try to be as respectful to the families as possible and you're looking for answers and you're trying to encourage people to look for those answers too so well done on all of that and if there's any updates or anything that you want to talk about coming up uh, please let us know uh, really we could have you on for four or five hours but we want to be respectful yeah. of your time we know you have a lot of 3d renderings to get to <laughs> yeah that's uh, right in the middle of working on one now as a matter of fact <laughs>